Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yawen Lei. I am an assistant professor at um, the sociology department at Harvard. And it's my honor to chair this panel on Chinese society to celebrate the 60th anniversary of, of the Fairbank Center. And today we have three panelists. And they will talk about family and inequality in China. And as we know, um, Chinese society has been changing drastically after its opening in 1978. And the three presentations uh, will shed light on our understanding of um, contemporary Chinese society. So our first uh, panelist is Professor Deborah Davis. And um, Professor Davis has been teaching at Yale Sociology. And she is an alumna of um, Harvard's East Asian Studies program. And um, she has published numerous books and articles. And her works has um, analyzed the politics of the Cultural Revolution, um, Chinese family life, um, social and welfare policy, consumer culture, uh, property rights, social stratification, and occupational mobility. And it's our honor to have Professor Davis back in Harvard. And the second panelist is um, Joe, Professor Zhou Xiang. And where is Xiang? <laughs> uh, he was here, yeah, but, and he'll be so, back. <laughs> uh, but let me. So let me just introduce our third panelist first. And the third panelist is um, Joe. Zhou Yun. And Zhou Yun is a doctoral candidate at Harvard Sociology. And she received uh, her BA from Peking University. And Yun studies social inequality through the lens of marriage and family. And as you, uh, some of you know, Ezra Vogel has been organizing a China sociologist group for a decade, more than a decade. And in recent years, Yun has been organizing uh, this workshop for us. She is a student co-organizer. And she has done a fabulous job in organizing the group and providing intellectual inputs. And um, so I've known her for three years, and there's no doubt that she is one of our top students at Harvard Sociology, and I'm really proud of her. And our third panelist is um, Xiang Zhou, and he's an assistant professor at the Department of Government. And although he works for the government Department of Government, he's actually trained as a sociologist. <laughs> and um, so uh, Professor Zhou is an expert of social stratification and mobility, economic inequality, social demography, and quantitative methods. And he received his PhD in sociology and also statistics uh, from University of Michigan in 2015. And because um, I am um, two years ahead of um, Professor Joe at University of Michigan, so I know many things about him. <laughs> and I remember um, when his advisor, Yu Xie, uh, recruited him, Yu Xie was very, very super excited, and he told me, you must meet with my junior students, and that's Professor Joe. <laughs> so, um, uh, so we are really happy that um, Zhou Xiang joined the big family of Fairbank Center. And let's welcome our three panelists. Thank you. Um, I do have slides, and I'm going to um, use most of them. Um, I look around the room, and I see uh, many people from my past and some from my present uh, work. and. This I'm going to try to make actually more informal. If you want to continue the conversation, actually this is a very academic paper, um, which I'm in the middle of. Um, but I wanted to start, of course, by thanking the Fairbanks Center for including me. And in the context of China, I'm a uh, Qiling Ho. That means I was here uh, in the early 70s, and that was an extraordinary time. But it also means it was a time when uh, graduate students and those people working on China, if they were Americans, uh, couldn't go to China. So that the arc of my career um, has been ex extremely um, easy in a way. So that I started in that uh, data mining uh, understanding, which meant reading things that were not digital, getting scraps of information, and trying to tell a story. Um, then moving to refugee interviews in Hong Kong, where you again put the scraps together, and you had a, a reflection of what was going on in China. And then my good fortune, um, my first job was at Yale, and my first year at Yale was the year that um, Americans were allowed to go to 
China. And so I began my field work in China in 1979. And I have been carried along by the wave of the transformation um, to the point that last year I was extremely fortunate to begin a three-year appointment as an honorary professor at Fudan, where the chairman was one of my PhD students. Um, so I won't go into more personal details. That's not the point. The point is just to say that the Fairbank Center and the uh, launch that I got here at Harvard um, has put me on an extremely um, lucky path. Um, and I, because of the of unfolding of opportunities in China, um, the kinds of things that were said at the end of the last panel that Deng Xiaoping let the Chinese people go, I think was how Rod put it, um, I have benefited. And this panel, you'll see, uh, here we have the next generation of sociologists who have been uh, part of a global um, era of innovation in our discipline. Um, I'm quite chauvinistic about what sociologists can do. And I think one of the things that we do and have brought to the study of China, both within China and outside, is on the methodological piece. Um, Yahweh said that she did not want, Yawen said that she did not want us to f focus on the methodology and we're not going to but I do want to tweak that because I think that is one of the pieces um, that currently makes the study of Chinese society so vibrant and so rigorous in a period of what appears to be an intellectual chill and the seven not to be discussed topics um, because I personally did not experience it that last year, and certainly when I'm here uh, working with the material, I don't feel I'm in an atmosphere of, of chill. Um, I don't know everybody in the audience, and I th th those I do know, I know are operating at a very high level <laughs> of sophistication and a great deal of information. So I apologize in advance. Um, I'm going to just hit the top of this topic, um, despite its more elaborate um, title and just make about five or six points. And I, so I'm going to skip over the um, abstract, but we can have the abstract later if you want it. Um, the baseline that I want to strike, I'm um, talk about Chinese um, marriage and family relations in the late socialist period. So in the work that I'm doing and in the story that I will tell, that's the contrast. So the argument about privatization of the institution of marriage and the re-verticalization of kinship is in the context of what was it like in the late socialist era. And there are six um, elements when we talk about family life in the socialist era that I want to highlight. Um, first is the material scarcity. Um, families and households did work with very little material resources. My own work is about urban China, and that's what I'm going to talk about. In Q&A, we certainly can talk about the rural story, which will have a different um, content, although the trajectory is quite similar. So the first thing I would stress about urban family life and marriage was the material scarcity, in particular housing scarcity, so that the average per capita square foot for family was less than three square meters. It was lower in 1980 than it had been in 1956. So people were living under crowded conditions. They were had very small amounts of space, and they also had no autonomy to go out in the market and change their uh, housing situation, which sent to the second characteristic, and that's the dependency, the degree to which family welfare and even the er the experience of marriage was informed by the dependent relationship that the head of household had with their employer. Third was the wage compression in that late period, which meant that um, there was relatively little difference between um, the generations in terms of their absolute income, but they're also with the principle of seniority was a first comer advantage. So earlier, many years ago, when I wrote about um, the occupational immobility and looked at the parent-child comparisons using data that cooked the families through 1990, um, what I emphasized was the degree to which young generation who should have been the winners of the revolution in terms of their education in comparison to their parents actually were not doing as well as their parents. So one of the other characteristics of these uh, urban families in the late socialist era was this also sense of loss of mobility, loss of 
sense that through um, the marriages or through the family relationship, you'd move the whole family forward and that the younger generation would carry the family forward. There was a sense that of enormous dependency of the young on the old. And by old, here I'm talking actually the adult child of 25 to the parent of 55 or 60. I'm not talking about the elderly, but I'm talking about that generational difference. Um, the fourth was the limited and politically compressed sense of the private realm. So family life was politicized, and the realm of in which one spent time and which one could seek autonomy was also uh, contained. The fifth characteristic was the geographic immobility. Families and people searching for marriage partners were highly restricted to particular geographic areas. And last was the dependency on the employer for the quality of life, for the quality of the school, the quality of your medical care, and the quality of your housing. And in that context, um, what happened to marriage and kinship. And there are four things that I would emphasize. One was that sexuality was conflated with marriage. There was relatively little sexual intimacy outside of marriage in this highly police, politicized, constrained environment. Um, secondly, marriage was a public institution. That is, the state through its legal action and the employer through the control of the permission to marry and divorce also were the first step in exceed or the final step in getting permission to marry. So marry, marriage was, in uh, Akko's terms, a socialized institution. Um, thirdly, um, the conjugal property relationship, to the extent that there was property, it was communal and it was conjugal. Um, and then fourth, this relationship between the families was strong. It's not that there wasn't uh, a strong a vertical tie, um, but the way in which it operated was there were because of there were more than one child, usually three children, it was not as intense. So it was a less intense uh, vertical interdependence, even though it was powerful and the elderly could support could rely on their children. So these are the big picture story about the baseline. Now, there are now uh, conditions which have intensified over these last 30 years, which I argue privatize the institution of marriage and re-verticalize kinship. Uh, in particular, I'm going to cite four. Um, changes that have happened and also intensified. Um, the ma new marriage law, the regulations, and you, if you know the articles that I've written in this area, um, actually court interpretations, um, have made marriage a voluntary civil contract between two consulting adults. And this is talking about the cities. So the role of the unit, the role of the Danway has been erased. The role of the neighborhood has been erased, and this has created what I would call a more privatized institution of marriage. Looking through the Supreme Court interpretations, um, which is I've spent a lot of time doing, um, particularly those surrounding the 2011 decision, um, has very explicitly increased the protection of private property and as it's owned by the individual, and gone so far as to undermine the claims of communal and conjugal rights to property. And this is very radical. Um, and we can take it in Q&A how, how, how radical it is and how widely spread, but the evidence I have says it's quite well supported. Um, the one-child policy um, created these 421 family structures demographically. Clearly that is critical to this re-verticalization. Um, the parents have only one hope, and the concentration of resources on that only son or only daughter brings an emotional intensity to the parent-child bond that was not there in the 1980s. So in the book that I'm doing, in the articles, you can see I'm going back to my research in the 1980s, as well as looking at the surveys, as well as doing the others. And this is why I think the demographic shift is of such consequence when we look at urban families in the current period. Um, and the last, of course, is the retreat of public support so that families are more on their own. Households are more dependent on what they can mobilize, the assets they can accumulate, and the assets they use. And then is the, the 
specific, more narrow thing about the privatization of urban real estate and then this recent acceleration exponential since 20, uh, 2005, um, which means that a new home, which is the expectation at marriage, um, is only possible with parental investment. Young people no longer uh, can make this transition to create their new home without the intense involvement of their parents. And this, again, intensifies those vertical loyalties in a way that was not the case in the socialist era. Of course, there's the bilateral trait. When I say reverticalization, many people will say, oh, that's a return to 1949. This is a patriarchal, patrilineal, Confucian society. Uh, that is important. That is, I would never discount it. But what is critical is in these urban areas is that half of the persons, <laughs> the child, is a daughter. And we know from many different ways in the surveys that if the only child is a daughter, there is a different dynamic. And there are other things that are going on. And it's a life course. It's the, when this little girl arrives and she's your only child, it begins at day one. And that then carries through because, of course, um, the work, place of, of work, the place of politics is gendered. Um, and family life is always gendered. But in this reverticalization, I'm particularly interested in the bilateral. So one of the projects that Sun Pei Dong and I did when I was in, in, in um, Shanghai last year is I had already started going to the marriage corner. Well, Sun Pei Dong did her postdoc on the marriage corner in Shanghai. So I went 18 weekends and did my own observations in my don't, in interviews, but we also used as a training exercise um, with a hundred with a students in her class the interviews. And what we're looking at, one of the things we're looking at is the variation between mothers looking for daughters, mothers looking for sons, fathers looking for daughters, and fathers looking for sons. So class, gender, always make a difference, and I'm pushing it. Um, now I just quickly am going to say what give you a sense of what is happening to marriage in, in China. Um, in case there are some people in this room who haven't thought about these. Um, so this is something from um, Gavin Jones' um, work in Singapore, but it shows the how what an outlier China is in the Asian condition. That is, China continues to be basically a, a city, a sorry, city, a country of universal marriage. And in this way, China still looks different than the other Chinese Confucian parts of, of the diaspora, but also from Korea and Japan. Um, then we look at education and marriage. I flag this because there's so much talk about the leftover women. Demographers and sociologists will tell you they're not left over yet. In fact, men are less likely to marry than women. The leftovers are, and this is from Egan, uh, this is a postdoc who was at Penn who gave me permission to use his slide. Um, you can see that women, they're marrying regardless of their education. What we have is delay. But when we look at men, men with low education, they are in fact falling off and they are not marrying. This is primarily a rural and a poor rural phenomena, but we start to see it in urban areas um, and it's something that I'm paying attention to. Um, at the same time that it's universal marriage, it's men who are less likely to marry, uh, marriages are very likely to, dis are much more likely to dissolve. This retreat of the unit, the legal uh, change, and the sexual mores, the change in sexual mores, means that people um, are, it's first of all, it's the easiest thing in the world to divorce. You go to the registry, you show your documents, you swear you haven't been forced, you have a piece of paper how you're going to divide your property, take care of the children. Half an hour later, you're divorced for 10, 10 renminbi. Now, they've started some new things where you actually have to talk to someone. I observed these last year. Maybe it takes an hour now, but there's no cooling off, there are no courts, and there are no legal, there's no legal intervention. That's 80% of divorces in China. There are those that go to court. I'm not saying there aren't, but basically, it may be one of the easiest places in the world to get a divorce, and it's also the one that's least regulated in terms of how to handle children and how to handle property. Um, to give you a sense, just a picture that I made up from from Tongji Nianjian kind of material, the blue is the marriage, the red is the divorce. You can see the, how the ratio changes. You also can see the numbers. Um, and these, of course, the marriages include remarriage and remarriage is increasingly common. In Shanghai, 20% of persons marrying in the last four or five years had been married before, and the 
the trend is upward. And so this is what Shanghai looks like. Um, now I want to briefly talk before my time walks out on the re-verticalization of family loyalty. And here I will just show some show some pictures. Um, so there are surveys, there are interviews, and there are also observations. So last year, what I did as a way to get into this um, in this more constrained environment, um, I did, in fact, focus on weddings. Um, and the paper I just wrote is looking at the ritual of wedding and how it's become more elaborated. And I did 70 interviews, and I watched 25 interviews, and I did video. Of, it was terrific for um, more ethnic, not ethnographic, but more qualitative for these sociologists. And um, in that paper that I just finished, or the, th the third draft, so I think now it's ready for <laughs> the, public, the public. Um, I've leveraged the work by Rob Weller, who is not here, but I know he's around, which are ritual as if. OK, so as if, what's going on? Um, this comes from the matchmaking. There's Pei Dong's, the cover of her book, um, which is based on the 07, 08, when the matchmaking corner began. We can talk about it uh, in what, who are these people? Why are they there? Um, when Pei Dong and Zhang Jun did the chapter in our um, Wives, Husbands, and Lovers book, um, we pushed them to tell the story through as the parent's story, which in fact it was. These are parents seeking a, a spouse for their child. In the, um, I went back, as I said, um, this is a picture I took um, a year ago. Um, since then, the professional middlemen and middle women have disappeared, but the parents are still there. And it's very um, rich and powerful. Um, research environment and as a way to get a sense of the level of anxiety among the most anxious who are willing to be out in front looking for a, a, a spouse for their child. So um, I think it was Yu Hua talked about the tip of the iceberg. This is the tip of the iceberg. From the interviews and from the life course histories, um, however, the bottom line is almost nobody, male or female, seems to be willing, or I should say 75% of people are unwilling to proceed towards marriage if their parents object. And I have multiple interviews and stories of people who come very, very close and then back out. I've also done focus groups where I set up different kinds of you know, scenarios, and it comes up again and again. So the parental power to channel people towards a certain spouse or even exercise veto is very strong. And I don't, I can never have the data to prove it. But my sense from all the interviews, I did hundreds of interviews between 1979 and 1986 in Shanghai and in Wuhan. Um, was less. People were very practical. If their parents made an arrangement, they would marry a virtual stranger. But I sense that the parents did not have the same veto power that surprise, surprises me. Beida graduates, Renda graduates, doctors, I mean, people who I thought of as very independent. The story keeps coming. I cannot marry someone my mother particularly will not approve of. And it's not because they're afraid of the mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. It's they are, I think, do, are, it's the threat to the intense personal and emotional relationship of adult children, only adult children and their parents. Um, weddings is what I studied. This is from a, a photo that we used in the focus group. I did not take it. My Chinese colleagues took it. Um, and. You can see it captures the parents at the head table and the, the couple behind them. And that is what my work shows again and again. Um, looking at how the wedding is organized, the rituals that have been in place. Um, the ritual that I compare in the paper is the tea ceremony, which was unknown in the 80s in the cities, uh, even in the, most of the 1990s, but now has become de rigueur will be done in the hotel if it's not done in the home, and the exchange of wedding bands before the public. So I'm looking at the tension between the horizontal bonds, the for voluntary horizontal bonds of the couple versus the vertical loyalties of their parents, and using the wedding ritual to talk about that. Um, the last question. I think I have two, sec do I have two minutes? OK, 
it's almost there. Um, so this is the household investment. That's where my project began. Uh, my project began, I mean, this area of my concern, privatization of property rights. We all were looking at that. When we looked at privatization of property rights, we tended to look at the firm. What I saw in my field work the family firm is very important, as they said in the last panel, but it's the ownership of the family home. And so I looked at inheritance disputes, divorce disputes, social welfare issues with housing, did that kind of work. And so I um, have kept my eye on that. And what we find now, and this comes from Xie Yu, uh, Yu Xie's, um, the Chinese family um, panel study data um, I'm going to show you. This is household composition. And in that project, they call STEM anytime the adult parent co-resides with a parent. That's not STEM in the usual sense of the three generations. And so um, they have the three years. And we're looking at 2010. And you can see that middle. This is nuclear is the big one. It's quite shocking. I mean, it is shocking. <laughs> what? You know, nuclear household is going down. Um, and so we look at the STEM going up. There are other things um, going on. Um, but that's where, for sociologists, the, the prize is. And this is a table I'm not going to walk through. But what I would show you is Shanghai in relationship to other places. No surprise, parents are, de are not only investing in their children's home, owning their children's home, co-owning their children's home, becoming, in case of divorce, equal partners or even a greater partner than the wife or spouse who's being divorced based on their prior investment, but they are also creating more STEM households. And that surprised me. Um, so. Are we going to see a re-socialization? Are we going to see the weaker ties? Are there challenges to this argument? I don't. Are there new barriers to no fault? Is there a heightened public scrutiny of intimate relation? Do we see migration creating greater? Is there impoverishment of the older generation? Is there going to be pension reform? Is there going to be more affordable housing? Will the one-child policy end? Everybody in this room's no. The law has changed. However, for those people who are in their teens and their 20s, it has not changed. And for their parents, it hasn't changed. So I will conclude by saying that I do think that when we look at China, urban China 2015, 2016, um, we will see um, a marriage institution that I'm calling privatized, and that these powerful emotional loyalties between parents and children more intense than in the late socialist period are also um, likely to continue. And I'll stop there and not run through the rest of it. <laughs> Good morning. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to give the talk here. Today, I'm going to look at the urban-rural boundary through the lens of the marriage market. Particularly, I focus on the effect and the meaning of a rural origin on individuals' marriage desirability from 1987 onward. In doing so, I use China as a case to speak to the broader sociological literature on a sort of marriage and um, the resulting implications for social openness and closure. Um, so before I delve into the Chinese case, I would like to first ground that China case a little bit in the context of um, the general discussion on the sort of mating. Scholars have studied extensively how marriage sortings happen along a variety of dimensions, including both individuals' ascriptive and achieved characteristics. Those characteristics include factors such as um, race, ethnicity, um, parental wealth, education, occupation, religion, and so on, and in different countries and across time. Because marriage signifies the acceptance of someone in one of the most intimate senses, marriage, all the lack thereof between members of different social groups, are viewed as a barometer of understanding social openness and closure and group boundary permeability. It's a fundamental indicator of assimilation integration and is consequential for our understanding of the reproduction of social and demographic structures. So how do people pick mates? Well, existing theoretical frameworks large, um, mar how marriage sorting happens largely fall into two camps. On one hand, we have the economic competition framework, which encompasses a set of different theoretical models. 
Here, the central focus is on the role of economic resources, often understood as the individual's present-day labor market attainment, on driving marriage outcomes and marriage timing. Um, here, the underlying logic is straightforward. Marriage is often conceptualized as this economic exchange between rational actors with differential utility in the household and in the labor market. And the individuals who have, who have better labor market positions and greater economic resources make more attractive partners. On the other hand, the culture matching framework, different from the economic competition framework that emphasizes the individual's present day labor market attainment, highlights the importance of shared norms, tastes, and values in driving marriage outcomes. Shared norms and values provide a basis for common discussions and reduce friction and tension in forming intimate relationships. And these two theoretical frameworks generally speak to have different implications for our understanding of social openness and closure. Essentially, it's a question of the power of the present versus the power of the past. So um, under the economic competition framework, economic resources are often sort of conceptualized or understood in individuals' present day labor market attainment. Thus, it's really the present that matters. Um, in fact, a group of scholars have found that for individuals who share similar adulthood class positions, social origin kind of lost its importance in driving marriage outcomes because as individuals, these um, people have gone through similar educational trajectory, occupation of comparable prestige and have access to shared earnings, assets, and networks. So if marriage sorting does follow this scenario, then it would point to a pattern or a direction of greater social openness, as individuals are indeed able to move beyond their ascribed trade and origin strata in the marriage market through adulthood status attainment. On the other hand, the culture matching framework speaks to the power of the past. Um, here, it, scholars have pointed to the lasting imprint of social origin on fam and family background on union formation because um, different classes are viewed as having distinct tastes, norms, values, cultural capital, habitus, and so forth. Thus, these cultural differences create, some scholars argue, creates and lasting difficulties to form intimate relationships across class lines. And to adjudicate these two theoretical frameworks, empirical research, although abundant, has several gaps. Some of the gaps are conceptual, others are methodological, and they are often interrelated as as well. On the conceptual front, research have predominantly focused on marriage sorting along a singular dimension, estimating the effect of a given characteristics, such as education or occupation, on, on marriage patterns, net of other factors. The interplay between individuals' ascriptive and achieved characteristics are often overlooked. And furthermore, marriage sort is not only by micro-level individual preference and tendencies, it's shaped by a host of macro and the meso level constraints and conditions. However, existing research have predominantly relied on quantitative ex post facto analysis of established unions. Thus, in this way, marriage is treated as a fixed entry point in time with binary outcome of success and failure. You get married or you are not in union, versus a sequential search process that's fraught with difficult decision makings and normative values and emotive meanings. So against this backdrop is where I situate my question on China. Particularly, I look at how do hukou origin and hukou change and educational attainment jointly shape individuals' marriage desirability in the marriage market. Particularly, I also rely on a mixed method design that combines three large-scale national surveys and 90 in-depth interviews to interrogate not only the patterns and the trends um, of marriage sorting, but also the underlying mechanisms and processes. So I argue that China, with its hukou system, actually offers an exciting and unique case to interrogate the logic of cultural matching vis-a-vis -vis economic competition in marriage sorting. So hukou system, um, most of you know, um, promulgated in the 1958, hukou the household registration regulation, it categorizes individuals as agriculture or non-agriculture. Um, and it's set up as a population control strategy to cope with 
with the state demand for rapid industrialization, and the rural-urban gap created and maintained by the hukou system is one of China's most profound social cleavage. And in the context of a marriage sorting, hukou, um, it's interesting and noteworthy because it has two layers of duality. The first layer of duality of hukou is hukou both as a social and a symbolic distinction. The urban-rural boundary is first and foremost social. Scholars have documented that the hukou system to be an important mechanism in, dis in differentially distributing resources and determining life chances. Research have documented the rural-urban gap along a variety of dimensions across individuals' life course, such as education, income, intergenerational mobility, health, and so forth. However, the rural-urban boundary is not only a, a social one, it's a symbolic one as well. Rural-urban individuals' populations are viewed as having distinct values, attitudes, tastes, and norms. And furthermore, in China, in popular discourse, rurality is often denigrated and devalued. Um, rural residents are viewed as having, um, are being less sophisticated, under-civilized, or having lower human and educational um, capital. And the second layer of hukou, uh, the second layer of the duality of hukou is hukou both as an ascriptive and achieved characteristics. Um, the hukou, which some has dubbed as China's caste system, is largely an ascriptive trade. In individuals' hukou status is primarily determined at birth based on parental hukou status. However, difficult as it is, hukou conversion is indeed possible. Educational attainment, particularly at a tertiary level, and military service and party membership are the primary channels for hukou mobility. Thus, scholars have argued that really the hukou converters are the best and the brightest of the rural population. Thus, in this light, the question becomes, for a select of the rural population then who have converted to urban hukou prior to marriage, then to what extent does it transcend such a social boundary enable them to cross? the symbolic one, symbolic divide as well in the marriage market. And more generally, it's a question of to what extent does the achieved present negate and offset the ascribed um, disadvantage of the ascribed past? And it offers an opportunity to adjudicate the theoretical frameworks because if really marriage sorting follows the logic of economic competition, we would expect hukou converters to fare similarly to their urban urban born peers in the marriage market. However, if it's governed more by the logic of cultural matching, then there might still be a lasting adverse effect of rural hukou origin, even for those who have on paper at least successfully crossed the rural urban boundary. So to answer these questions, um, the, to look at the patterns and the, tr the aggregate level patterns and the trends of ascriptive and uh, of uh, hook, urban hukou marriage, um, I rely on three data sources: three largely national representative surveys, the 1986 um, his life history survey, the 03 and 06 CJS data, um, and these data survey provides information on individuals and when applicable their spouse age, educational attainment, hukou history at the time of the marriage. Furthermore, um, the 2006 Six stages data allow construction of three hukou trajectory group, the rural-born non-converters, the hukou converters who converted prior to marriage, and the urban-born individuals. And to anal and quickly to analyze the data, I relied on Schorn's model of harmonic mean marriage function, which estimate um, this is uh, which estimate a composition independent force of attraction parameter between male of characteristic I and the female of characteristic J. And this model offers a key number of methodological advantage to conventional modeling strategies. And I look at the aggregate patterns of first marriage across three compositions: age, sex, age, sex, hukou origin, and educational attainment in the hukou trajectory and in two periods. 2006 stages, the most recent data suitable for analyzing hukou conversion and urban rural marriage. It's already 10 years old. So to 
gain a much more updated understanding of what's going on now and also the underlying mechanisms that explains the patterns we might observe. observe. I rely on, on original in-depth interviews I conducted between January and March this year. Um, the interview data include 90 structured in-depth interview with both men and women who are not in union with each other. And to qualify for the study, one has to be 24 to 36, heterosexual, have completely some form of education. I primarily focused on interviews with never married men and women um, because those are the people who are actually currently in the process of finding partners and making marriage decisions. And I supplement that with in interviews with individuals in their first marriages to see for some people how the decisions actually eventually got made. And because the respondents all have some form of tertiary education, all but three currently hold urban hukos, but there's more variations in their huko origin. And the respondents are recruited using snowball sampling um, across two metropolitan areas in China. Um, the interview protocol further covers a, key, a, a variety of key questions um, relating to marriage selection and the may, uh, marriage sorting, the may selection. We talked about their ideal and when applicable their current spouse. Um, we talked about um, their perceived obstacles in marriage entry, like what uh, what what if there's lack of housing or whether it's a sort of um, lack of financial resources and so forth. And we also talked about dating histories and why some romantic relationship in the past have dis disolluted. Um, and we talked about the meaning and expectation of marriage. And I also asked explicitly the respondents to evaluate a set of tangible socioeconomic and demographic, demographic traits when they're looking for spouse, particularly to look at sort of the acceptability of rural born partners I designed a set of vignette-like probes. I present the respondents with hypothetical partners in which I kept the rural origin as a constant while varying other attributes to see how their relative acceptance changed. And also the interview data, we talked about gender ideology and the social, some social demographic information. And um, the interview, I inductively identified um, key themes from um, the interviews. So now we look at the findings. First, we look at the crude patterns of force of attraction by age and hukou origin in the two periods. And the blue bar here indicates the strength of the attraction parameter. Um, here, first and foremost, we see that marriage sorting is really governed by a pattern of both hukou and age homogamy, as indicated in the, diag the, the, the big blue bar in the diagonal cells. But, for, but however, the second prominent finding is that urban-born men fare much better than their rural-born counterparts. Um, for um, the force of attraction between older rural men and younger rural women are larger than, than the reverse pairing, meaning that rural, uh, rural urban-born men are more able to leverage their urban hukou to marry younger rural-born women, as young age in women is generally viewed as a desired attribute in the marriage market. This kind of points to the more advantageous position rural urban men holds. And furthermore, even in age homogamous and hypogamous pairings, the force of attraction between urban men and rural women are higher than the reverse, which this is significant because it means that for urban-born men, they do enjoy a great greater pool of potential mates, which points to the marriage squeeze. Um, Professor Davis also talked about for um, rural born men, particularly rural born poor men. And now we bring education into the mix and see how the desirability, uh, undesirability of rural origin change for individuals who have crossed on paper the rural urban boundary. Here, the darkness of the color indicates the strength of the force of attraction. I draw your attention particularly to individuals who have um, completely some form of post-compulsory schooling, that is individuals who have some secondary and tertiary education. Here, I, we see that for urban-born individuals, the force of attraction are the lowest between them and educationally homogamous rural-born rural -born counterparts. The force of attraction are slightly higher, indicated by the slightly darker color between them and hukou converters, yet they are by no means as high as that of individuals of rural urban-born origins.
And when we look at the force of attraction for cocoa converters across educational homogamous couples across three cocoa categories, we see an inverted V shape in their force of attraction parameters. The lowest is again between the cocoa converters and rural born individuals. The peak of the V is between converters and converter pairings. So what does this more all mean? Taken together, we see that hukou converters indeed fare slightly better than their educationally homogamous, unconverted um, rural counterparts. Um, here we see that for hukou converters, they present they, they prefer present day other urban hukou holders, um, and also for hukou convert for urban born individuals, the hukou converters also also re represent a more attractive option than their educationally homogamous unconverted uh, rural peers. However. They are by no means on par with educationally homogamous peers that are urban born themselves. In other words, um, such improvement can't fully erase the adverse effect on rural huko origin, nor can it truly elevate the huko converters to be completely on par with their educationally homogamous urban peers. So to what extent does this pattern hold after 2016 and 2006, and what might explain the patterns we observe? So now we turn to the, the qualitative findings. When describing marriage ideals and the partner ideals, nearly all respondents adopt a highly emotional rather than economic logic of framing. So for example, when I asked Ya, a 23-year-old single woman, what she looks for a ideal spouse, this is her answer. He needs to be my best friend. And it must be pointed out that it's not only that younger woman who holds such a rosy ideal about marriage. Framing such as best friend or companion, like zhiji, pengyou, banlu, are highly salient across the board. And furthermore, when we talk specifically about those tangible socioeconomic traits, um, there are minimum stated preference for, for spousal occupation and income. In fact, Bao, a 27-year-old woman, said, well, I don't care about his job as long as he's happy and fulfilled. And this is a sentiment echoed by a large number of the respondents. So at face value, this complicates the quantitative results. If marriage truly is framed in such an emotional, all we need is love light, why do ur rural, urban, rural hukou origin holders fare worse than their urban counterparts? So now we turn to the findings of um, the meaning of rural hukou and how rural hukou origin people are evaluated in the marriage market. Here, um, when, we, uh, when, when I ask uh, the respondent whether they would accept someone rural born, they unanimous, you, nearly all respondents, both men and women, quickly stated that they will. However, this fourth right acceptance are, not, are also met with an equally quick qualifications. So consider this quote from Juan, a 25-year-old woman. She said rural born men will be fine as long as we have similar worldviews. However, because I think um, he's rural born, and I think that's unlikely given how different his family and the rural environment he grew up be must be. So this under under desirability of rural hukou has little to do with what commonly the less advantageous socioeconomic positions commonly associated with rural hukou. Rather, rural born individuals are imagined to be completely different, having different norms, values, or lacking shared experience. Furthermore, it's particularly striking that this lack of shared experience, this cultural difference, can't be fully compensated by economic resources. An Italian quote is from Nana. She grew up in an affluent household, and she described her upbringing as independent. Her parents are as like non-interfering. So she said, even if his family is well off, um, I would still say no, um, because I wouldn't get, be able to get along with his parents. And it will be difficult. And the probes from uh, the, and and probes from yet from vignette uh, yield similar results for individuals who express initial hesitance about marrying rural born individuals. While I vary the attribute of the other characteristics, making them have a much higher income or more pre prestigious job, graduating from a top university, that initial hesitance does not often go away. 
Of course, not everyone rejects the possibility of marrying a rural born.、Um, in fact.、Um, Among the 29 respondents, six all urban-born are married to people of individual、um, from rural Hukou origin, and those six people are evenly divided、um, between the gender line. And when I talk, when we talked about how why they accept individuals of rural Hukou origin, there's also this logic that highlights a sense of affinity, particularly、um, in. Imagine this quote from Mu, a 28 single woman. She,、uh, she said, "A rural man will be fine because, well, I'm not exactly an urban girl myself. I grew up in a small town. My parents are blue collar workers. Really, we are not that different. So, really, this is like the second side of the same coin, which highlights the logic that the, highlights the importance of shared norms, values, and tastes and experience in driving marriage outcomes. So, what does all this tell us?" Taken together, the results show that the rural-urban boundary remains to be highly salient in China's marriage market to this day. We also see mate selection follow a largely culture-matching logic that emphasizes the importance of shared norms, tastes, and values. The adverse effect of rural hukou origin on individuals' marriage desirability can't be fully negated by adulthood status attainment. Um, which means that、um, for individuals who have successfully crossed the social boundary of the rural-urban gap, the dimension, their hukou origin as a symbolic distinction, remains to be highly visible and divisive in the marriage market. In this sense, even with the possibility of rural-urban hukou mobility. The rural-urban cleavage created and maintained by the hukou system remains to be deeply ingrained. Of course, individuals' stated preferences and norms are not always realized, and in fact, individuals often adapt their preferences to a various set of institutional constraints. So, with the future work、um, and with agent-based computational models, I'm going to look at how this. How, in, how adaptation of preferences happen, and how population level outcomes emerge from such micro level interactions, particularly in the context for understanding rural urban inequality and、um, the marriage squeeze in the context of China's highly skewed sex ratio. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Hey. Thank you very much for having me,、uh, and thank Yawen for a very kind introduction. And today I'm going to report some recent findings about income inequality and intergenerational mobility、uh, in China, which、uh, are partly based on my own research and partly from others, as you will see. So specifically, I'm going to address four questions. First, how high is income inequality in today's China? And second. What are the major determinants of inequality in China? And the third, somewhat related question is: Why has inequality increased in recent years, especially since the mid 90s? And finally, will high inequality necessarily lead to social unrest and political instability? So now let's look at the first question: How high is income inequality in China? So this question appears to be a simple fact that we could check directly from the government statistics. But unfortunately, this is not true of China, and many of you know that for many practical and political reasons, Chinese government statistics are not always reliable, especially when it comes to people's well-being, such as GDP growth or inflation. And actually, in the case of inequality, the National Bureau of Statistics stopped releasing the Gini coefficient since 2000, when it first passed the point of 0.4. So as a result, for more than a decade. Scholars didn't know much about the level of inequality in China, but this kind of silence was、uh, broken in late 2012, when there was a big media splash around the Gini coefficient, which was triggered by an economist named Gan Li from the Texas A&M University. So, in a press release, he reported that the Gini coefficient among Chinese families has reached. The alarming level of 0.61, which would put China among the most unequal countries in the world, on a par with Colombia, South Africa, and Lesotho. And the, 
the findings reported by Gan Li was uh, were based on the China uh, a survey called China Household Finance Survey, which himself uh, directed um, in the Southwestern uh, University of Finance and Economics. And data from that survey also indicate that the average income, income per capita in urban China was actually higher than that reported by the National Bureau of Statistics. But the distribution of income is much more skewed. And you can see from the middle panel, the top 20% of Chinese families control about 70% of the total household income, which is much higher than that in the United States, which is already the most unequal country uh, in the developed world. And as a result of this highly skewed distribution, we see the alarming level of Gini coefficient at 0.61. And only a month later, the National Bureau of Statistics responded. And in a press conference, and the NBS speaker reported the Gini coefficient for the previous 10 years, for every year from 2003 to 2012. And according to the NBS, you can see the Gini coefficient among Chinese families did not increase at all. It basically fluctuated around the level 0 0.47, 48. And actually, you can see declined a little bit from to, uh, since 2008. So overall, the level is much, much lower than the, uh, the estimate reported by Ganli, 0.61. And the discrepancy between the two estimates generated another round of discussion and debate, not only among scholars, but also among journalists and Chinese netizens. And in an effort to resolve this debate, we, Yuxi and I, uh, try to calculate our own estimates of Gini coefficient on the basis of uh, six, uh, seven newly available nationally representative survey data sets, one of which is a large-scale inter-census survey administered by the National Bureau of Statist Statistics. But the other six are all independent university, uh, all from independent university-affiliated survey organizations. And in particular, two of them are uh, Chinese General Social Survey in 2010 and 2012, and we also have the Chinese Family Panel Studies, the Chinese Household Finance Survey, which I just mentioned, and also the Chinese Labor Force Dynamic uh, Studies. So for each of these surveys, I calculated the Gini coefficient among families who reported a positive income in the previous calendar year. And my results are summarized in this chart. So here, the black dots are estimates of Gini coefficient in China report assembled by the United Nations for earlier periods. And the red dots are our own estimates based on this independent survey data sets. And on the basis of this whole time series, I fitted a, a non-parametric curve. And based on which you can see, there has been a dramatic increase in, in, in income inequality since the early 1980s, uh, since economic reform started. And According to this smooth estimate, in 2012, the Gini coefficient is around the level of 0.55, which is much higher than that reported by the uh, government. But on the other hand, it's also much lower than the 0.61 estimate reported by Gan Li. So our estimate is somewhere in between. And interestingly, both Gan Li and the people from MBS said their estimate was closer to us. <laughs> and this chart puts China in a comparative perspective. So basically, I compare trends in China with those in the other four emerging economies, Brazil, India, South Africa, and Russia. And you can see China has experienced the most dramatic growth in inequality uh, over the last three decades. And now China is more unequal than India, Brazil, and Russia. And uh, very close to that of South Africa. So now let's move away a little bit from the abstract Gini coefficient because it didn't, it doesn't tell us anything concrete. So let's look at concrete income distribution. So basically, in this bar plot, different bars show family, uh, different bars show family income at different quantiles among Chinese families. In, two, uh, in 2005 and 2012. And the black curve shows the income growth for different quantiles over the seven years. You can see there has been a tremendous, tremendous growth in income among, among Chinese families across the board for 
at all quantiles. For, for instance, the median family income almost uh, tripled over the seven years. But the growth is not even, and you can see the rise of inequality is mainly due to the poor lagging behind rather than the rich leaping ahead. So our first conclusion is that China's income inequality since 2005 has reached very high levels with the Gini coefficient in the, ra in the range between uh, 0 0.53 uh, and 0 0.55. And from the previous chart, you can also see the increase in inequality is not much driven by growing concentration among the top 1%, top 5%, but mainly because the poor are lagging behind. Now let's move, to the, move on to the second question. What are the major determinants of inequality? So to answer this question, we in the same paper, we compared China with that of the US. In particular, we this chart shows the partial R-squares for different var p variables. So the partial R-square is a regression statistic that we use to gauge the extent to which uh, overall income inequality can be explained by a particular variable when we control for everything else. And you can see uh, we have three, uh, five key independent variables, five key predictors of income. Region, region is measured as province in China and state in the US. Area type correspond to the uh, urban rural division. And you can see in both China and the United States, the most important factor determining inequality is education. But apart from that, China's inequality is much more mediated by regional and rural urban disparities, whereas uh, inequality in the United States is more mediated by individual level factors such as race, ethnicity, and the family structure. So this brings us to the second conclusion, that is a substantial part of China's high inequality still due to regional disparities and rural-urban gap, although we have also seen a very significant uh, influence of educational attainment. Now let's look at the third question. Why has inequality increased in China? So from the previous chart, you might suppose that the rise of inequality uh, might be due to growing rural urban gaps and growing regional disparities because they are more salient in China than in uh, developed countries such as the US. But this is not necessarily true because China has long been characterized by large regional gaps and large rural urban division. And this is to some extent part of the legacy of the command economy, the Maoist area policies. So. Another ex uh, candidate explanation is skill biased technological change, which is a very popular explanation for the rise of inequality in uh, advanced industrial countries such as the US. Basically, the theory of SBTC says that globalization and technological change tends to drive up uh, the, command, the demand for skilled workers relative to un unskilled and semi-skilled workers. And because skill is usually associated with educational attainment and signified by educational attainment, we tend to observe an increase in returns to education, which will in turn drive up overall inequality. And in the context, China, I want to emphasize that the dramatic changes in labor force structure might also have uh, in, have, have influence on trends in income inequality. Specifically, first, the expansion of higher education since the late 90s has generated a more dispersed educational distribution. This is because the college expansion has uh, mm, generated a larger and larger fraction of Chinese workers who have, who have a college or advanced degree. But on the other hand, the China system of nine-year compulsory education also means that a large fraction of Chinese labor force only have elementary school or junior high school education. So the education distribution has become more polarized and more dispersed. And everything else equal, this would translate into a more dispersed income distribution. And finally, the privatization of the economy also means that the relative proportion of state sector and private sector has shifted tremendously in that the, the share of public sector employment declined a lot. And because usually income distribution is much more egalitarian uh, in the state sector than in the private sector, so the decline in state sector employment, the rise in private sector employment also has a compositional effect 
to, to, to drive up overall inequality. So in a recent paper, I attempted to adjudicate these competing explanations. In particular, I adjudicate the, the latter four explanations for the rise of inequality only among urban workers. So from this chart, you can see the Gini coefficient among urban workers, uh, the Gini coefficient of earnings among urban workers has increased a lot from about 0.4 to 0.49. And my key results are summarized in this table. First of all, you can see almost none of the increase in inequality over the past 14 years can be attributed to widening regional disparities because simply we did not observe a rise in regional differences in average income. Instead, about half of the overall rise in inequality can be attributed to increasing returns to education. And this is consistent with the skill bias technological change, but can also be driven by many other factors. For example, the market transition theory basically says that the transformation from the state socialism to a market economy tends to drive up in returns to human capital. And also there has also there has been also evidence showing a greater emphasis on education uh, in, in, in promotion of state officials. And so there's basically a greater uh, credentialism among uh, Chinese politics and also economy. And on the other hand, we can see that both changing educational distribution and the changing sector composition can account for about 20% of the overall increase. And when these are taken together, which I didn't show, about 40% of the total increase can be attributed to the compositional changes in the labor force. So our third conclusion is that the rise of urban inequality during the past two decades is mainly due to increasing returns to education and also changing labor force structure. And I think the Chinese government might like my conclusion because they are basically inevitable consequences of marketization and modernization. So this inequality is the, like, like, like the price we have to pay for development. And finally, let's look at the implications of inequality. Will high inequality necessarily lead to social and political instability? So to answer this question, it might be helpful to look at what have been the major sources of regime legitimacy for the Chinese Communist Party uh, since the founding of the People's Republic. Over the first 30 years, and I think the legitimacy is more ideological than material, the egalitarian, is, uh, the egalitarian uh, and socialist policies ensure that everyone is from the same big pot and there wasn't so much unfairness or discrimination or inequities complained about at the first place. But since the reform started, the inequality has grown a lot, as we have just saw. And the common wisdom is that the CCP tends to uh, derive more and more uh, of their legitimacy, uh, their legitimacy from strong economic performance. What's happening? OK, so what's next? So what would be the future source of legitimacy? As we can see, the economy is already cooling down, uh, perhaps uh, beside, uh, except the real estate market. And also, the inequality is likely to stay high. So what would be the future source of legitimacy when high economic growth is, can no longer be sustained? And this is a fascinating question. I'm, I'm sure that different people have different thoughts. But one candidate that I would like to emphasize here is meritocracy, which is a key element of the Confucian culture, which I think the government tends to promote over the recent years. So how do we go about measuring meritocracy? And there are these two ways. First is look at the perceived meritocracy, to look at Chinese people's attitudes toward inequality. So whether and to what extent, in what ways, are, uh, they are tolerant of high inequality. And the second is to look at the actual trends in intergenerational social mobility and compare China with those of other countries. So let's first look at the first. So this chart is borrowed from an article published by Marty White, who just retired from the sociology department here. And I think the results here are based on a 2009 survey that he conducted. So the respondents were asked uh, to attribute the causes of why people in China are poor. And you can see the top three explanations that ordinary Chinese people give are lack of ability, lack of effort, and low education. 
For instance, about 60% of the Chinese population thinks that lack of ability has uh, played a large or very large influence in explaining why people are poor. And this is much higher than the same uh, results for, other con for, for almost any country that Marty White examined. And by contrast, you can see only about 20% think that unfair economic system has large or very large influence. And similarly, when we look at their attribution of why people in China are rich, you can see the top three explanations are ability and talent, hard work, and high education. And this is nearly seven years ago when Chinese people attributed the causes. So now let's look at the actual trends in intergenerational social mobility. So I'll uh, skip this part. So basically, in a recent paper, I argued in some detail as to how market transition might affect it, uh, uh, social mobility. And it would be helpful to look at this chart, which is what we call the golden triangle in social stratification research. So basically, your social destination is, determ is determined by your social origin, not only directly, but also through education. So the argument I make here is that the transition from command economy to a market economy tends to, in China, tends to strengthen all of the three links here. So first of all, apart from education, the expansion of the private economy tends to strengthen the link, the direct link between origin and destination. This is because the, 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 the expansion of private economy tends to generate abundant of opportunities for old state cadres to, to uh, convert their political power into material resources. And I think this morning, Yuhua just talked about state business relationships. They're just, they're highly intertwined, and you can see many state officials uh, converted themselves into businessmen or, or patrons of private businesses controlled by their friends or relatives. And because material resources are much easier to inherit than political capital, so we tend to see a strengthening of the link between origin and destination, even without education. But on the other hand, you can see the abolition of the egalitarian educational policies that were carried out in the Maoist period also tends to strengthen the link between origin and destination. And empirical evidence already suggests that um, the, the, gra the, gra the SES gradient in education attainment in China has significantly strengthened over the past 20 years. And finally, the uh, liberalization of labor market also tends to strengthen the link between education and your social destination. So in overall, we tend to, we, we, our hypothesis is that the transformation from state socialism to a market economy will drive up uh, the intergenerational association between, uh, uh, in socioeconomic status. And our results are consistent with the prediction. And you can see from this, so the bars, uh, so here the horizontal axis is a measure of the intergenerational association in socioeconomic status, which I, I call status hierarchy. You can see status hierarchy strengthening in China from the cohort born in the 1950s to, to the cohort born in the 1970s. But if we compare China with advanced industrial countries in Western Europe and North America, you can see China is still a quite fluid society, at least among the cohort who were born in the 1970s. And by the way, data from these other countries were collected in the 1970s, so it's quite, uh, not quite comparable with, with the current uh, levels. But empirical evidence suggests that overall mobility has stayed uh, pretty much the same for uh, most uh, advanced industrial countries, including the US. And another interesting finding you can see here is that the only country that is comparable to China is Poland, which was also a state socialist society back in the 70s. So this brings us to the last conclusion, is that today's high inequality in China is not very likely to cause social unrest. First, because ordinary Chinese people still highly believe in and endorse merit-based inequality, and also because intergenerational social mobility is still relatively high by international standard. Thank you very much.
Um, so I think I'll just raise one question and then we just open discussion to the floor. So my question um, for uh, Deborah and also for Yun is um, would you please um, specifically talk about the implications of your findings about marriage pattern uh, for the reproduction of inequality in China? Because I think this is a link. I mean, that's the way we can really relate the three presentation. And for Xiang, uh, my question is like, um, the in uh, increasing equality has been a global issue, and in the recent U.S., the current U.S. Um, presidential debates, and people talk about how to address um, inequality. And um, as far as you know, how has the Chinese government responded to um, increasing equality? Has the government did done anything to solve the problem, and how effective the intervention is? specifically about okay. it. Okay, sure. Um, thank you, Yavin, for the question. My thought um, from the finding of the paper is that um, the rural-urban gap is in terms of marriage desirability in the marriage market is really driven by this logic of sort of this symbolic di distinction. Then that really creates the implication that even for those rural-born individuals who later achieve the stat status and obtain economic resources, then those under undesi undesirability sort of persists. Then in the context of China's growing concern of sex racial imbalance, what we are seeing is what will the marriage squeeze look like? Um, is it going to move beyond those poor, urban rural poor, to sort of a broader segment of sort of the rural and urban underclass? And that is sort of for a broader implication for China is on one hand the gen gender dynamics, both in terms of work and family. The state recently have shifted to the discourse that encourage women to stay home and to be like more more wifely and uh, um, sort of wifely wives and good mothers, um, but also sort of this implication for social unrest, as we do see um, sort of this higher growing number of unmarried single men having correlated with sort of concerns around that. And that's my thought from from the paper. Yeah. Um, just quickly, I think um, it, the question of the micro mechanism and the habitus, to the extent that um, families are seeking to reproduce, whether it's matching on the achievement or matching on the uh, habits, um, I think it does uh, heighten reproduction. But it has to be seen in the context of what um, Zhou Xiang has talked about, that comparatively speaking, China still seems to be um, a country on the move. So I think marriage matching is definitely one of the mechanisms um, that frees patterns. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I don't want to make predictions and, and <laughs> think uh, whether inequality will continue to grow or decline in China depends a lot on the government initiatives, whether how, how willing they're uh, uh, they're, uh, uh, how, how much they are willing to address in growing inequality, and I'm not sure the priority of reducing inequality in the Politburo. And but for uh, uh, the thing I want to mention is that uh, from my results, the the, the forces that are driving up inequality in recent years uh, and are not. Uh, are not so re uh, reversible because they are a natural consequence of marketization, development, educational expansion, other things. But if the Chinese government is willing to address inequality, I think the area they are, should w work on is to reduce the artificial urban-rural divide and regional disparities, to give more incentives to mobilize more actors to reduce the inequalities between the inland poor rural provinces and the coastal areas. And there's also uh, a force, I think, uh, the multinational companies are now gradually shifting their like factories into more inland provinces because of cheap labor there. So I think the the the, the future is bright. And and uh, another thing I want to mention here is to to reduce inequality uh, and uh, promote mobility is look at the triangle I just showed you. And I don't think the link from origin to destination and the link from education to destination uh, we we can do much about it. But I. I do think that we could do a lot of things to reduce educational inequality between rural and urban, between uh, st uh, students from different family backgrounds, especially, uh, first of all, I think the, the, the gradual 
uh, dismantling of the hookah system would be beneficial to people from rural origins for their uh, so that they have the same rights for to 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 the same schools but rights doesn't right the same rights uh, uh, don't mean the same opportunities we have a lot more to do but also the 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 current system of nine year compulsory education i i do think that if I were a Chinese leader, I would consider to to make the educational distribution more more homogeneous, to 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 upgrade the the lower level, the lower end by making the the compulsory education twelve years rather than nine years, so that we if we can upgrade the the, the manufacturer labor, we could also meet the challenges of globalization and technological change. As you know, that the Chinese wages have been growing, and the multinational companies are shifting their factories to Bangladesh, the poorer areas to India. So we 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 should we have a lot uh, to do to upgrade our human capital endowment among the Chinese labor force by by upgrading the education. I'd like to speak in a very different way. Um, I also like um, Zhou Xiang work on this, and this is the class I'm teaching right now. Um, the difference, this U.S.-China comparison is, is important, but um, inequality of income is what a capitalist system drives. That's driven. Um, but the distributional effects can be a responded to. And I think here, you look at France you, and Germany, you look at Sweden, which actually have Gini equant income ones that are comparable. But the outcome when we look at life chances are different, right? Whether it's life expectancy, education, and in the U.S. case, the intergenerational mobility in Europe is greater than the United States. Why? Because the inequalities of income are buffered by limiting the inequalities, particularly in education and medicine. And I think this is what we do see happening uh, in China. Um, the class I did last week was on educational inequality, and this week was on the health inequality. Um, I think the policies that we see, um, many of the ones that um, Zhou Xiang just mentioned, are definitely things that the government wants to do. Definitely. They are trying to address these distributional inequalities, which then could reduce the degree of social reproduction. But if we look at the mechanisms within families, they are not interested in inequality of the social level. And the families are acting on their own interests, which is to reproduce their own advantage. So on education, what we see is 500,000 uh, children coming from China to the United States. Um, why? Why is this outpouring? Right? These are the advantage seeking in education. It's huge, this uptick. In other words, the flight from uh, higher education. And what is the government doing? They're trying to stop it. But the families are finding strategies. So I think that the family mechanism is powerful in education. And the other piece that we see in education is this SAT track. In the last two years in, China, in Shanghai, all the elite schools flipped. And now the majority of kids are not in the Gaokao track. And working class families cannot make the expense to go into the Gaokao. And what I see at the national level is a rather weak. On one hand, they've said the Gaokao is not going to use English anymore in adding up the score. That's good for the rural kids. It's good for the kids who are not coming from the most advantaged backgrounds. But at the other hand, they're allowing the schools to create this channel of the non gaokao channel. And if you listen to why parents are doing it or why they want to do it, there's also the idea these people are going to return to China and they're going to be the real leaders. They're going to have creative thinking. They're going to be, you know, superior to what we're producing at home. So I think the educational challenges are huge. Mm -hmm. And and we look at the medical thing, uh, we didn't talk about that, but in this latest World Bank um, assessment, which was published last month, they show the privatization of healthcare, which is huge. 18% of physicians, 25% of hospital beds are now private for profit, not just private, but for profit. But when we look at the number of patients in hospital admissions who were in private hospitals and private clinic, the number is flat. So I think in medicine also, we can see efforts to try to um, change the economic, the, the penalty for growing economic inequality. But I think this 
connects to what Zhou Yun and I am talking about. Family as individual decision makers mm -hmm. are extremely nimble in working around to mm -hmm. maintain their advantage. I don't know if you would agree. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. That's awfully strong. Um, <laughs> So I so now I just open the discussion um, to the floor and um, so they would take question. I don't think really any composition people the room is not this big. Uh -huh. My name is Mario Pini. I am a retired Italian diplomat and an associate of the same. Uh, I would uh, I'm very grateful to the speakers, but I would be happy. Thank you. I thought people could hear me. <laughs> I would be happy if somebody could feel a huge hole because Professor Davis spoke about uh, urban society and if she will forgive me what I understood is that uh, certain realities of the past like the dumb way are not relevant anymore while certain other realities like parents their importance is increasing because now parents have an incredibly strong umbilical cord with uh, one child so kids don't uh, uh, they feel this influence and they don't marry easily without their parents' approval. But uh, I did not catch anything about the countryside, the big divide. Mm -hmm. I heard about uh, who could transfer, but the big reality in the countryside, could somebody very quickly, because I think it's pretty late, mm -hmm. say something about reality in the countryside, about marriage? I think Thank De you. Deborah mentioned that you have something to say about countryside. Then, uh, right? I didn't catch it, I yeah. apologize. Well, you only have 20 minutes and you can only talk <laughs> about a piece of your work. Um, the marriage piece is extremely important and I think um, both of my more qualified uh, survey researchers can give you facts. But the marriage age population, my estimate is between 60 and 70 percent, depending on the province, are in urban areas. So they have their parents still in the rural area, but the actors themselves are in an urban environment. And the Nobody wants to be a farmer. That's nobody wants to be return. So the question, of course, the question is how do rural communities mm -hmm. uh, reproduce? How they survive? Um, it's huge. Um, one term that we all have used is the hollowing out of the countryside. This is indeed profoundly important. So I would like give them both time to talk about it. Uh, the parents, the majority of parents, almost, that the majority of parents are in a village setting. The other thing to say, of course, about village China is extremely diverse. When we talk about Zhejiang, Jiangsu, or any of peri-urban areas, we are talking about entrepreneurial and often wealthy, in relatively wealthy households. So when I compared the two ladders in the socialist period, the rural ladder always stood below the urban ladder, but now this is not true. Um, so we can no longer generalize about rural versus urban, although when we talk about hukou and conversion, it, we can use that binary. But the reality is that both urban, but especially so-called rural, is extremely diverse. So I leave it there, and maybe Zhou Xiang is once, and then Zhou Yun. Uh, yeah, I totally agree that uh at least in in the in the re, in the realm of inequality, rural part rural China is understudied and 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 rural China is very heterogeneous. And if you look at if you calculate the the, the inequality among rural families, it's much higher than that in the rural, urban part. And and there's huge disparities between the coastal provinces and the inland provinces. And and also I think there is increasingly blurring between the rural and urban division, both administratively and also geographically. And and when we conduct surveys, we no longer, you know, divide the two areas and sample. And we, we, we just do spatial sampling because a lot of regions in China, you cannot say it's rural or urban. Just, they're, the peasants are not no, no longer in the field. They, they're, they longer, no longer, they're no longer farming, but, you know, it's not so urban. And I... Yeah, I think I think the pressing problem in the future for, for the rural part is is mainly what uh, Professor Davis talked about uh, the leftover men. They cannot get married. They 
they I think they're just they're very unlikely to get married ever and and I think I don't know what implications will be in the future, either politically or socially. You know. Mm. Yeah, and then there are also like six millions of left behind children. Yeah, in the rural area. Yeah. Right. Although the Huang, there's one. Um, I didn't use the slide because I ran out. He was talking about the the numbers of unmarried men quote left over will be higher, but it's only at something in 2060 that percentage will be higher than the 50s. So this is not the first time that China, as a population, has had this huge overhang of unattached men. It, actually, it was more extreme at an earlier period, which was the legacy of the past infanticide of girls and other uh, reasons that um, there's not a match. And he also lags it um, by age. That is, men will generally marry a woman two to three years younger. So you lag the birth cohorts over time. So actually, this leftover man is just now beginning to really have a big impact, even. Yeah. And also, I completely agree that sort of um, the rural urban binary is sort of a very dichotomous way to look at the gaps, and it's um, sort of mediated by regions as well. <laughs> and I also want to sort of mention that another piece of my research look at um, child rearing strategies among mm -hmm. urban and rural families. Um, in in there, we also do kind of see a convergence even among rural families to aspire to some of the similar um, norms or attitudes about sort of concerted cultivation. That's commonly found in urban families. But the problem is that the resources are lacking in rural schools and also sort of by the virtue of the education of the rural parents, they're kind of um, there's this unmet desire. So I think that's also kind of the problem because um, with that, that it's kind of it's not um, it, it's not exactly you don't you don't want what you don't know, but rather we do see this angst and this anxiety among certain rural families to to met to map that. And that sort of speaks also to Zhou Sang's point about education, the linkage between origin and ed education. Mm -hmm. So we take the last question. Uh, I feel so excited because I'm a sociologist too. Oh, thank you. And uh, to have opportunity to, you know, to talk about these issues. And uh, first of all, I want you know, uh, to Thanks for uh, Professor Davis talking about revitalization of family relationship. I observe that in, also in, the, in my personal life to see you know the, how family uh, you know generated resources help children. My question uh, it is the role of the internet on family because of the internet of affordability, approximation, and uh, in terms of sexuality, you know, the, the Chinese men, uh, higher level, Chinese, they you know, call you know, actual marital relationship or xiao sar or something. And uh, to what extent these are, you know, e effect? Because uh, Castell talking about, you know, the internet, you know, uh, information network society uh, change social structure. To what extent these internet change social structure? <laughs> and uh, I have a, uh, just a quick another question for uh, for Professor um, Joe and uh, one thing it you, know, you talked about income another one it is housing everybody knows you know housing in China has exploded and we talking about Boston expensive or Cambridge does you look at Beijing China those major area mm -hmm. so these wells tremendous wells and uh, you know also how did this you know it doesn't matter you know and uh, those uh, elite, they have houses, you know, uh, in Beijing or Shanghai. Those, you know, transformation of wealth, and uh, you know, I just want your comment. That I really like to see, you know, research things like that. Thank you. It's easier to talk about wealth than it is to talk about how the internet impacts. So, I mean, as sociologists, you know, we can't draw a line between one and the other. And therefore, I will just say very briefly that um, certainly, um, as I've observed uh, life changing on the ground these last five years, um, the Weixin uh, revolution has had a huge impact clearly on the degree to which people connect and what they learn. Uh, there. 
maybe um, this Professor Joe knows that there's an internet study that's done it. Um, in our survey, which we did in rural China and other surveys, you do have these questions, you know, about internet use. And I was surprised that it was seemed to be so low in this argument about the rural who, you know, rural people don't use it in urban. This is not what I observe um, because people are using the phone. There are 700 million people on the phone and they are using the internet. Um, so this Final thing on family, what I've observed with my students when I'm working in the field, when I'm in Shanghai with my colleagues, is that people are interacting with their parents about food, about their child's pickup, about housing prices. Um, so I would say that the internet, especially the Weixin in piece of this, has allowed um, people in China to connect in real time across um, geographic distance in a way they never could before. There's no survey. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree with you that internet is playing a bigger, bigger role in shaping the social structure, not only in China, but also in everywhere. Sure. And, and I think the main, the, the most significant way that internet is different from mass media, from other radio television is that you is totally customized in Weixin platform you can subscribe what you want to listen to and this would have tremendous consequence for the segregation of you know uh, not only social structure but also culture and and also opinion polarization and people mm, People are only willing to what they want to listen to, and and you have motivated reasoning. You it will reinforce the the view the, the views of how the world works, and the 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 Gong Zhong Hao, you know the the WeChat uh, um, accounts that I subscribe to would be totally different from a WeChat account. Um, you know, if you look at a migrant migrant worker in China's. Uh, metropolitan area and so it's there as i think they will create more and more overlap in people's worldviews values tastes other things and about uh, well um, about uh, housing i th i think this is a fascinating topic that i would like also to see more research on especially the the the, in the impact of the housing market boom on inequality i and my personal impression is that the the housing market boom and also the relaxation of credits in China, in China, but not only in China, in everywhere else, would have a deteriorating impact on current inequality because you know those who have access to credit are already very rich and they have so it will reinforce the current inequalities. And I think in Hong Kong you have a, such a phrase that if you buy a house. You, you you get on a train, you know, and train will al always moving faster and faster. And if you don't get on the train, you're lagging behind more and more. And so, so as long as the housing price is rising in inequality, I think material inequality will also rise. And and I I I don't want to predict when the housing market will collapse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we would add as because we do have the surveys and we are sociologists. In the initial period, um, the housing resource was a leveler. It reduced it right because of the way in which the gongfang were given out. And so we actually have data that let us can see. So the initial redistribution, which was my point about what can the government do when income inequality mm -hmm. and I remember interviewing a um, in Shanghai with one of the welfare this was after a million Shanghai textile workers had been dismissed right and he proudly said and we did not have a single strike which wasn't quite true but he certainly didn't have people in the streets and the solution was we gave them all houses so he was very aware this was early on this was 2000 that the redistribution of public housing was a major way to bring in uh, more stakeholders to the reform, which was create, eliminating their jobs. And what the data that I've seen, and now I can't remember who's published it, 
whether it's from the chip data or whether it's from the China household panel survey, we can then watch when we look at the value of housing, the wealth when the, the genie will go up. So there's an initial period when the government really was explicitly using privatization of, of public goods to ease uh, what was going to be a hard landing for some people. And now they've backed away from it and let, quote, the market rule. And the result is the winners win more mm -hmm. and the losers are stuck. Yes. We, yeah. Well, and that's unfair. also the right housing price will spur more inflation. And more inflation would mean that the debtors will benefit more than creditors. And in China, debtors are rich people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to thank our three panelists and the audience as well. Thank you.